Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Jared Kaplan from uh, John Hopkins University. He's the professor at physics and astronomy departments. And uh, he works on different, different areas of quantum field theory, on particularly conformal field theories. He's the uh, member of the Simons collaboration on the non-perturbative bootstrap. But today he will actually talk about something uh, else, which is very important at present for all physicists. So like he will talk about machine learning and he will show us how that is important uh, at present to think about on that direction. So the title of, of his talk is Machine Learning and How Physicists Can Think About It. So please, you can start. Great. Uh, thanks so much. It's, it's really an honor to be, uh, uh, quote unquote, here um, addressing all of you. Um, obviously, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions, um, whatever I can do to clarify uh, uh, this talk. Um, so I, I'm primarily at, at Johns Hopkins University, as, as you heard, um, but for the last few years I've been collaborating a lot with uh, researchers, actually almost all of whom are former physicists, at a research lab called OpenAI um, that I, up until very recently in, uh, was sort of 100% research on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, there's also a group that I collaborate uh, 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 significantly with. Um, that uh, was literally formed by uh, mostly high energy physicists who uh, uh, many of whom you, you may have heard of, uh, Guy Guerreri, Ethan Dyer, Adam Brown, um, Iger Lukowitz, um, who uh, basically formed an institute at Google X that's entirely sort of former, former physicists doing machine learning. So uh, uh, I think physicists are and will continue to have a huge impact on this field. I think a lot of uh, aspects of the way that we think are actually, I mean, uh, uh, to be an arrogant physicist um, as well or better suited to, to the problems that one encounters in this field as the way that computer scientists think about it. And I'll sort of elaborate on this uh, as, as the talk goes on. Um, but this is something I've been very excited about because I think it's really changing the world is, gonna, is going to continue changing the world rather quickly, um, also for reasons that, that you'll see as the talk goes on. Um, so, uh, uh, if you uh, Google arrogant physicist cartoons, you can find a very large number of examples. Um, and uh, that's definitely going to be a, a, a problem with this talk. So there's all these jokes about how um, you tell a physicist what you're doing and they'll explain to you why uh, you should be doing it differently and then tell you that it's all trivial. Um, so this talk will definitely uh, have that that flavor. Um, so I apologize in advance if there's any sort of uh, machine learning experts uh, who are not physicists who, who, who are insulted, but uh, uh, that's sort of my last apology. And then uh, uh, <clears throat> beyond that, I'm just going to sort of tell you how I think about this subject, how I would explain what it is. Um, and uh, so here's an outline. Um, most of the talk is going to be about sort of what is contemporary machine learning? What are people doing? How should you think about it? And I think there's a really simple central point if you haven't sort of observed it before that really covers basically uh, everything that, that is going on and that is generating a lot of hype right now. Um, I'm gonna give you a bunch of examples um, because that's, that's fun of sort of different techniques and different problems where, where we seem to be making a lot of progress in machine learning. Um, uh, because I'm a physicist, I think one of the super important things and a thing that I think uh, probably you won't hear from, from ML experts immediately is what are the relevant scales? Like how big are the data sets? How big are the models that are, are fitting those data sets? How much computation is being done? What does it compare to? And, and really one of the things that's kind of amazing because we've had, I don't know, 50 years of Moore's law in computation is that uh, the scales of computation that go on here are getting comparable to numbers like Avogadro's number, um, like the number of atoms in a mole. So they're just really, really enormous scales of computation going on. And I think that's, that's just interesting to think about by itself, because um, that's, that's really how I think about the world in terms of scales and scaling. Um, I'll talk a little bit about different philosophies of 
artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the, the huge boom that's going on, and it's been going on for almost 10 years now, um, but really that's not a long time, um, takes a fairly different approach. And a lot of the, the successful techniques take a fairly different approach from the way artificial intelligence was thought of, say, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and so I want to sort of emphasize that distinction because it also is relevant for to what extent this field is similar to physics versus, say, being similar to classic uh, 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 computer science. Um, and then, I mean, depending on time, um, I'll talk a bit or maybe a lot about some work I've done in the last uh, year or two um, about uh, something that sounds very, very much like physics. Uh, really, it seems that there are some uh, very, very precise empirical scaling laws in machine learning. Um, and basically, those are, are unexplained right now, but they're, they're very precise. They're as precise as what you'd see from uh, a condensed matter experiment or something like that. Um, and they were relevant to this model that has a completely meaningless cryptic name, GPT-3, which is which recently released and I participated in, um, which is uh, in, in some respects the best language model um, in existence. And so I'll, I'll talk a lot about that work, um, some preliminary work I've done with, with one of my students to try to explain why it is that scaling laws appear in machine learning. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and basically that'll be it. So please interrupt with any, any questions um, or comments. So, uh, let's go on to, to the main part of the talk. We'll just be explaining what machine learning is. So in one slide, um, literally kind of everything that's been very exciting this past decade in machine learning is just regression or curve fitting. Um, so we as physicists are very, very familiar with situations where you have a bunch of data and you look at the data, and it's clear that the data is not random. I mean, the y-axis is strongly correlated with the x-axis, and there's some pattern there. And something that we're very used to doing is sort of guessing some curve that fits the data, that passes through the lines, uh, a line that passes through the points. Um, and it's really the case that uh, all of machine learning is just doing that, doing this in, uh, with, with very, very, very general functions with very complex data um, and with, in some cases, sort of cleverly chosen uh, loss function. So when you, when you pass a curve through a bunch of data points, there's a very intuitive question, which is, um, what is the measure that you use to decide whether the curve is close to the data points or far from the data points? And I mean, the most basic thing that, that, that we tend to use is something like, least squares. Like you ask, what is the distance of each data point from the line? What's the square of that distance? You can try to minimize it. So um, that's basically all there is to, to machine learning is figuring out a class of functions that you can use to fit a bunch of data points, figuring out uh, sort of how to present the data, um, what, how to in, encode it, and then coming up with some function that measures how close you are to actually describing that data. And that's that's really all of it. And then all of the variation that you see from like playing Go better than humans to modeling language to making sort of quote unquote deep fake images that look like they're real photographs, but were just completely generated by a machine. All of that is really just sort of figuring out those three aspects. And so that's, that's really what, what I'm going to then be elaborating on. Um, and uh, there's a cute uh, 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 Twitter post that I think uh, accurately describes a lot of things that go on in tech. In particular, AI is just regression. Big data is just data. Um, and data science is really just statistics done by people who aren't experts in, in statistics. Um, so uh, it's not just me who says AI is just regression. Um, Twitter also knows. Um, and so what are models doing? Um, so. Uh, when we think about AI, something that you might think of, and of course, if you watch a science fiction movie, the kind of thing you'll see is that AIs are sort of these very, very robotic, logical creatures um, that are making decisions based on rules. And that was sort of what AI was um, in the past, in sort of the 60s and 70s, the kind of first wave of AI was, was kind of all about um, human beings thinking about how they think and then coding that into a computer to try to get it to, to, to imitate. Um, 
in, in contrast, the, the sort of current progress in AI is kind of the opposite. Um, the, the thing that current models are worst at is logic um, and applying sort of systematic logical rules. And the thing that they're best at is what I think of uh, metaphorically is really intuition, which is understanding all sorts of complicated correlations in, in, in data, in some game that they're playing, et cetera, um, and kind of developing what I think of as intuition for sort of what's a good choice, what's a bad choice, what's likely to happen, and what's, what's not likely to happen. And um, the way that this is learned, as, as we'll see, as I'll sort of repeat a bunch of times, I mean, the way that learning occurs is a lot like some sort of, uh, say, quench or process in a condensed matter system, where um, it's, it's kind of hopeless to understand what every single constituent is, is doing, um, but really the way that we should think and, and, and do think about these systems is through a statistical understanding of what often uh, amounts to emergent behavior. Um, so in order to kind of proceed with uh, doing curve fitting in a very fancy way, um, the first thing we need is a very general and versatile way to express very, very complicated, very, very general functions. So we need this way of parameterizing very general functions so that then we can, we can, we can do curve fitting. And we'll parameterize these functions with, with a lot of parameters, thousands or millions or even billions of parameters. And what learning will amount to is figuring out what value those parameters should take in order to, to fit and describe the data. And so what a neural network is, and everything I'll be talking about today is, is neural networks, of what a neural network is, is really a way of building up very, very general, very complicated functions, um, basically by using high dimensional matrix multiplication and some very, very, very simple nonlinearity. So if you just want to build a very complicated linear function, all you have to do is use matrix multiplication. But if you want to build a more complicated nonlinear function, multiplying many matrices together just gives you another matrix. Um, so you have to introduce some kind of nonlinearity. And uh, that's that's really all a neural network is, uh, is combining matrix multiplication with some simple nonlinear. Um, so what is one layer in a neural network? So neural networks uh, are almost always can be described as some sequence of layers that processes the data. So an individual layer um, proceeds as follows. You start with some vector which initially is just a, a, a data point, and we'll describe how we, how we encode the data in a second. But we just have some high dimensional vector x in a very big vector space, um, hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of dimensions um, uh, for our vector space, um, in some cases even more than that. Um, and so a thing we can do is we can uh, apply some linear or technically affine transformation to our vector x, by making w dot x plus b. Um, and that gives us some linear transformation on x. Um, so to add nonlinearity, to encode a nonlinear function, um, we could do a lot of different things. But in uh, machine learning, the thing that we actually typically do almost all of the time is apply the simplest nonlinearity that's possible. So the simplest nonlinearity that I can really think of is a function that is just x for x positive and is zero for x negative. And in the machine learning community, this has the uh, overly fancy name of a ReLU. Um, that stands for rectified linear unit. It doesn't really matter. It's just the function that takes z and outputs max z comma zero. Um, and that is the nonlinearity we apply. We apply this nonlinearity component wise. So when we compute w times x plus b, we get some new vector. And we just apply this nonlinearity to each component individually in the vector. Note that if you're, uh, if you're a mathematician, if you love linear algebra, this is sort of breaking the, the, the vector space structure because you're working in a specific preferred basis that we just, we just have, have chosen ad hoc. Um, and that's what a layer of a neural network does. Um, so uh, the data is x. The parameters of the neural network are these w's and b's which in the literature are usually called weights and biases. Um, for kind of intuitive reasons, W is reweighting the Xs, and B is just adding some extra term, so it's sort of biasing the sum in some sense. 
Um, so that's just pure terminology. But it's very important to distinguish between the data X and the neural network parameters W and B. The data is fixed. Um, the data might be, say, images or language or Go board configurations. The parameters W and B are what we learn in order to uh, train our model to do well at our task. Um, so to be incredibly explicit so that no one, uh, no one can be lost, um, you might learn neural network parameters that take the form of this matrix W, which is four, five, six, et cetera, and these biases B. You might have some single item of data, which is say a three vector. You just compute W times X plus B, which gives you 29 and minus 14. And the nonlinearity of machine learning is just dropping the minus 14 and getting this output. A full neural network will just be the composition of many layers like this. The Ws and Bs in each layer are different. There's a different uh, set of neural network parameters in each layer. But all we do to, to make our neural network function is compose many layers. So that is how, uh, that is how neural networks work. Um, and uh, this is technically in the middle literature. This, this specific kind of neural network might be called either a multi-layer perceptron, which is just it's just some verbiage. It's some code for a sequence of matrix multiplications followed by this function. Um, sometimes it's also called a fully connected network. And you may see pictures like this picture that I've drawn on this slide, where there's, uh, there are these nodes, and there are lines drawn between the nodes, and, uh, and eventually there's output. And it's possible that if you've never worked on this subject, you might be confused and think that something very fancy is going on here. Somehow it's mimicking the brain. But Literally, all that this diagram means is that we've, multi we've taken some input vector, which is five-dimensional. We've multiplied by a seven by five matrix and, and transformed our data to be seven-dimensional. We've acted with another seven by seven matrix. Then we act by it with a four by seven matrix and get the output um, uh, with these biases and these ReLUs happening in between. But that's really all this kind of picture uh, means. Um, so these kinds of pictures are just a silly way of writing a sequence of matrix multiplications followed by dropping the, uh, the negative items. So that's what a neural network is. Um, that's the basic. And you can, just with this idea, you can, you can do things that seem interesting and, and, and impressive if you've never done them before. So um, the hello world uh, example of machine learning is, uh, classifying the MNIST data set. Um, the MNIST data set is a list of 50,000 handwritten numerals. They're encoded as 28 by 28 pixel images. They're just black and white. They're just grayscale. Um, and so uh, uh, these are 28 by 28 images. That means that you can view them as 28 times 28 dimensional vectors. I think 28 times 28 is 784. So these are 784 dimensional vectors of pixel values, um, 50,000 images. And uh, you'd like to train a neural network that classifies them in the yeah. obvious uh, There is a question in the chat box, if you can. Ah, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe, can you just read it out? Yeah, just to clarify, in the previous slide, is the nonlinearity applied at each layer or at the end? Ah, perfect. The nonlinearity is applied at each layer. Um, that's what makes it uh, uh, on a fully nonlinear function. Um, if you were to apply it at the end, you just have a sequence of matrix multiplications, and you could write the product of all of those matrices as one matrix. And so it would be kind of a waste to have uh, all of these different parameters representing the sort of three different matrices uh, in between. And so, so we apply the nonlinearity after each wx plus b. Great, good question. Glad to clarify. Um, thanks for asking. So um, the way that we can try to classify this, these, these numerals is by encoding our input as a 784 dimensional vector, where each component of the vector is the brightness or the, the blackness versus whiteness of each pixel. Um, and we train a fully connected neural network, just like on these last few slides, um, that processes the 784 dimensional vector and outputs 10 numbers. What are those 10 numbers? Well, 
uh, the typical way that we approach this is we output 10 numbers that are 10 different probabilities for, uh, for the particular image to be a zero, a one, et cetera, through a nine. Um, so how do we output these probabilities? Well, the thing that's very, very, very trivial to output based on what we've said so far is uh, we can output 10 numbers, but those 10 numbers will typically be numbers between zero and infinity. So how do we get probabilities? If we have 10 numbers between zero and infinity, a way to describe this as a physicist is we can call these 10 numbers 10 different energies. And if you're given 10 energies, um, and you say set temperature equal to one, you can compute a probability from the usual Gibbs distribution in Statnec um, of, uh, of zero through nine as the uh, e to the minus, say, x sub zero divided by the sum of e to the minus x sub zero plus x sub one plus x sub two through x sub nine. So that's just you're just computing e to the minus x zero divided by the partition function. Um, what I've just described is in the machine learning literature called a softmax function. So uh, it's just the function that you get by computing e to the minus x divided by e to the minus x summed over all x's in the denominator. Um, and so that's a way of taking 10 real numbers and outputting 10 numbers that can be interpreted as probabilities which sum to one and uh, each individual probability is between zero and one. So what we do is we do, we do what we described in the last few slides. And then on the very, very last layer, we produce 10 numbers and then we process them with this softmax, which is, which is like computing the partition function in order to uh, output probabilities. Um, and now, so now we have a structure and we train our neural network by trying to learn the values of the W's and B's, the, the matrices and these, these biases or offsets in our network. Sorry, um, Gerd. Yep. Uh, there is another question. May yes. I, may I tell this? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about the beta parameter in the exponential? How does one choose that? Ah, great. So because the network gets to output whatever X's it wants, um, we just set beta to be one, we just fix it, and then we let the neural network learn the parameters that output energies from a physics point of view that, uh, that give us the probabilities that we want. So uh, that's, that's how we just set beta to one in this case. Um, uh, in theory, we could let the model learn it, but equivalently it can learn that by just changing the scale of the matrices. You see if in the last layer, we multiplied the matrix by some constant. That would effectively rescale all of these, uh, all of these outputs that we get from, from the final layer. And so, uh, and so we can just set beta equal to 1. So, uh, can I uh, follow up on that? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I mean, are you saying that it doesn't make a difference whether you set beta equal to 1 or, or 10? I'm saying that it's equivalent to a rescaling of the matrix in the final layer. And so, uh, and so therefore, it's already encoded in the parameters, which are, which are these matrices. And so uh, in that sense, it doesn't matter. If you were to fix okay. these parameters and then change beta, that would change, uh, that would change the outputs. Uh, which parameter? Which parameters oh. uh, did you say? Um, it would be the parameters from, uh, from the matrices in the final layer. So um, if we think about what happens in the, in the final layer at the very end, um, we map whatever the vector space was in the, second, in the next to final layer um, with w times x plus b, and then we drop anything that's negative. So if I were to sort of rescale w and b by a constant that I, I mean, I could call it beta prime, um, that would make these final, uh, these sort of pre-final layer outputs uh, different by an overall constant. And that constant would be the same constant that we would get by including a beta in these exponentials. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, just one point. So sure. please don't write in the chat box. You can directly ask the speaker. Uh, don't need to write in chat box. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
So um, what I've just described is sort of a building block. What I've said is we can, uh, and I've been somewhat vague about it, but we start out with a 784 dimensional vector. We act with some number of layers, which is up to us. We could have two layers, three layers, four layers, whatever. And finally, at the end, we map down to a 10 dimensional vector space. And then we act on it with this partition function, this soft mass max function that outputs these probabilities. So that's a way of taking an image that's uh, made up of these pixels and outputting a probability that it's a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, but what we actually now need to do is figure out what these matrices and biases B have to be or should be in order to fit the data well, in order to accurately describe these images. And so what we need for that is uh, what's called in the literature a loss function. As a physicist, I think the natural way of thinking about this is as a potential. Um, this is basically some potential. It's a potential that we think of as depending on the neural network parameters, the Ws and Bs. And what we would like is for this potential or loss function to have a minimum at a location where the neural network is doing a good job of describing uh, these digits, describing the data. So what we would like is um, <clears throat> when the neural network sees a three, like this three that, uh, that's, that's, that's written on this slide, um, as, a, as a pixelated image, we would like the probability for uh, three, the label three, to be very, very, very big. And we like the probability for one, two, four, et cetera, to be very small. <clears throat> so a very uh, a simple choice of potential that has this property is just minus log of P3, the label three, when we uh, encounter an image which looks like a three. So remember, we have a training set of 50,000 images that come with labels, so they're correctly labeled. And what we're trying to do is learn a function that when it sees these, these pixelated images outputs the correct label, or at least says the probability of the label, the correct label is very, very, very high. This is a function, notice when P3 is one, this is zero. When P3 is less than one, this function gets bigger and bigger. Um, and so this is a very nice natural function. Now there, this function, I mean, you might wonder, could I choose some other function instead? There are a lot of other choices you can make. This particular function, um, uh, which is called the cross entropy loss, has a lot of nice properties. If you're someone who's thought a lot about information theory or quantum information theory, you may be familiar with the relative entropy. <coughs> um, uh, the relative entropy in the machine learning literature is called the KL divergence or the uh, Kublik Lieblach divergence. Um, and uh, this cross entropy choice is very closely related to the fact that the relative entropy, if you've encountered it before, has a lot of nice properties. Um, the cross entropy is basically uh, uh, the relative entropy um, between the sort of label distribution and the, uh, uh, and the distribution that our neural network outputs um, minus some constant term. Um, so I'm not going to go into that very much. There's a lot that you can read about it uh, if, if you're interested. But that's one reason why people like to, to make this choice. So, so uh, Jared, what is the purpose of taking this uh, uh, stochastic variable in this discussion? Ah, so that's, that's the next part. I haven't gotten there. Um, so uh, the first thing that we need is this potential or loss function that will be minimized when uh, the model is working correctly. The second thing that we need is some way to actually get to the minimum of the potential. So this is called in uh, machine learning optimization. You start off with, <clears throat> we initialize the parameters of our model to just be random numbers. So all of the mat matrices, all of their entries will just be initialized to just some, from some say random Gaussian distribution. And we need to learn uh, what values those parameters should take so that uh, uh, we get good performance. Since we have a potential, we can uh, compute the gradient, like the, the slope of the potential, and we can take steps um, towards the minimum of the potential. And that's what gradient descent is. So gradient descent says um, you have some set of parameters. The Ws and Bs are being sort of encapsulated as these thetas. We have some theta at step n, uh, 
that's what the, the little n means. And we learn the theta at step n plus one by updating the parameters uh, via epsilon, which is some random number, some number that we choose, which is called the learning rate times the slope of this loss function, uh, del theta of the loss. And we take sequential steps in order to try to get to the minimum of the loss. And if we've gotten to a minimum or the minimum of the loss, um, we've improved the model's performance. And then we can hope that the model then will do well, not just on the training distribution, but on new pixelated images that we provided. Why is this called stochastic? It's stochastic because we typically use mini batches of data or just batches of data rather than the full data set. So something you could imagine doing is computing this potential for all 50,000 images in the data set and then taking a step. That requires computing um, all of these matrix multiplications and then this uh, softmax and then this loss function 50,000 times for all 50,000 different data elements. Then we have to compute a derivative then we do an update. That's a lot of computation to do. It turns out that we can be a lot more efficient and possibly gain some, some other advantages by say only using 100 images at a time. So we take the first 100 images in the data set, we compute this, we take a step, we take the next 100 images, the next 100 images, et cetera. Um, and because therefore we're not uh, using the full data set, but we're using some random subsample of the data set, we're doing stochastic gradient descent. So this is typically approximate, uh, uh, called in the literature SGD, stochastic gradient descent. It's gradient descent because we're just computing the slope of the potential and taking a step. It's stochastic because we're using a subsample of the data that's randomly chosen. Um, and the, the sort of main reason why we take a subsample of the data is uh, to save computation. Um, another reason why we do this is that there's some intuition that having a random walk, uh, having, having the trajectory that we follow in parameter space be somewhat of a random walk is good um, because in this situation, I've drawn a, a very nice sort of quadratic-like potential, but the potential we actually encounter, first of all, it's in an incredibly high dimensional space. Remember that our data vector is 768 dimensional. That means that the matrices we use are going to be something like 768 by, I don't know, a few hundred. That means that there are sort of thousands and thousands of parameters. Um, so we're in a many thousand or tens of thousands or even million dimensional space. And our potential function is not guaranteed to be convex. It's not guaranteed to sort of only have one nice unique minimum. So by introducing some randomness, we hope, we'll sort of avoid getting stuck in some place that we don't want to be stuck in. And we hope that we'll find a good minimum. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this is, is not very well understood at all, um, but, uh, but nevertheless, it seems to work. Um, so uh, to sort of talk about scaling uh, scales in this problem early on, remember MNIST has 50,000 images. The images are 784 dimensional vectors. A thing that's natural is just to preserve that dimension. So 784 squared is 600,000. So that means each layer of our network is going to have something like 600,000 parameters. Um, that means that we're going to be living in something like a, a, I don't know, say five times 600,000 dimensional space of parameters. Um, and typically, you might pass over the data set maybe 20 times during training in order to try to find the minimum. Um, so something that might seem extremely surprising to you at first sight, but which is often typical, is that uh, um, at least if you count data as 50,000 images, the number of parameters is much, much, much bigger than the number of data points. Um, that might surprise you because, of course, um, if you, say, have a data set in physics that has 10 data points, you probably wouldn't think it's a good idea to fit 10 data points with 100 parameters. But that's literally what's going on um, in machine learning in, in this example. And this is actually just very generic, very typical, that we often uh, have more parameters than data points. Um, so this is a surprise. Why is this possible? Um, we know something about why this is possible, why it's possible that this works. But, uh, but in a broad sense, I think we don't understand this very deeply at all. Um, Excuse me, I have a question. Um, yeah. 
uh, don't you think that the system will be overfitted in this way? Yeah, so that's exactly what the problem is intuitively. Um, uh, so it will, so, so that's certainly the intuitive problem, which is why this seems very surprising. Um, that's exactly, exactly the problem. Um, one thing, so there's a very basic thing you can do and everyone does, um, which ameliorates this somewhat, which is um, we have this, these 50,000 images in the training set, but typically we'll have, say, a few thousand images, maybe, maybe five or 10,000 images in what you might call a validation set. And as we train our neural network, <clears throat> we will measure the loss or the performance or the accuracy on those 5,000 validation images. And at every step or every few steps, we'll make of that measurement. We'll see how does our model do when it's evaluated on the validation set. And what we'll see is that the performance in the validation set for a while improves and improves and improves. But at some point we enter this regime of overfitting where basically the model is just gonna kind of memorize the training set. And at that point, training performance keeps improving, but validation performance starts to get worse and worse. And a thing that we can do, which is called early stopping for obvious reasons, is just stop training at the minimum of the validation set loss or the validation set accuracy. And that's a very simple thing. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of what's called regularization. Regularization is the term in machine learning for avoiding overfitting. Um, and if we do that, that, that helps a lot. So we won't train forever. That's why we only end up training for say 20 passes over the training data. Um, we'll stop uh, at the minimum of validation set loss. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So there are a lot of, this is, I mean, this is a vast field. This question of how to avoid overfitting is something where there's a ton of work. Um, early stopping is the simplest thing you can do. It does quite well. You can do a little bit better with some fancier techniques, but, uh, but that's, that's sort of the intuition. Great. So um, uh, machine learning is often associated with big data. Um, so another example of a data set that's much more interesting um, is called ImageNet. It's maybe the data set that people have worked on in the machine learning community the most. Um, so ImageNet include, is, is made up of real world, real, photorealistic images like the things that you see on the left. Um, the full images are 256 by 256 pixels. Um, there are a million images in ImageNet. They're broken up into a thousand different classes of objects. So there are like lots of different kinds of, not only are there dogs, but there are lots of different breeds of dogs, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so there are a couple of points that I want to make about this data set. Um, first, it's sort of worth knowing about because the moment when neural networks became an active field of study was really in 2000, a very active field of study, was in 2012 when uh, uh, a group, uh, 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 namely including someone named Alex, um, <clears throat> the first author of this paper was Alex, um, made a neural network that did really, really well at classifying these uh, ImageNet images. Um, they did something like, their accuracy was something like 10% better than sort of their competitors. And that created a lot of excitement about neural networks. And everything that's come in the last eight years has sort of really kind of followed from that. So neural networks existed as an idea, I mean, back into, I don't know, the 50s or 60s or 70s for sure. But uh, as of like the early 2000s, people thought that they weren't very good. They thought that it didn't really make, they didn't really make that much sense. These overfitting problems are a huge problem. The fact that the loss is not a convex function and therefore you have no idea whether you're in a local minimum or a global minimum or what. All of these intuitive problems with neural nets caused people to think that they basically weren't any good. And it was this AlexNet uh, result in 2012 that really sort of drove uh, people to start working on them. And now they just completely dominate machine learning research. Um, so that's one reason to know about them. The other is, that uh, uh, the approach that we just took for MNIST seems impossible here. 256 by 256 means that there's something like 600,000 pixels in each image. So if we were to take the approach from, from before, um, we would need a matrix that's 600,000 by something in order to process these pixelated images. Um, and 
if you were to use a square matrix, it would be 600,000 by 600,000. It would be like, it have like 10 to the 11 parameters in it. And that's just sort of totally crazy and uh, not practical. Uh, it wouldn't even be practical right now, um, despite the, the tremendous growth in, in compute used. Um, so how can we do better? And that's really sort of uh, 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 what kind of one of the things that's described in the field is sort of how can we do better? And so this is a case where sort of being a physicist is, is, uh, helps in an, in an obvious way. Um, we can try to organize things by symmetry. Um, so <clears throat> we can try to specifically use spatial translation symmetry in order to build our neural networks. And so this is what's called a convolutional neural network. The idea is that we have convolutional filters that we run over the image. So <clears throat> we might have a five by five pixel area. In our five by five pixel area, we only have 25 pixels. <clears throat> and so we'll have a matrix that acts on just those 25 pixels and transforms them into some output, um, or maybe many outputs. So uh, that's, that's sort of what we see on the very left here. We have, uh, we have this stack. We have like, say, a picture of a car. The picture of our car has, say, 256 by 256 pixels in three colors. So you see there's this stack of three uh, uh, slices on the very far left in this, in this slide. And those three slices represent the three colors. So we can have a little, a little filter, which is acting on a five by five area. Uh, and it acts on all three colors. So it really acts on sort of 75 inputs. 75 is a very manageable number. It's a very manageable number for sort of the, 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 the side, side of a matrix. Um, and so what we do is since the system, we expect images are fairly translationally invariant, we can pass this filter over the image and have it act sort of in every different little area of the image. But it's the same matrix, 75 by say, I don't know, 75, acting on uh, on this on this area of the image <clears throat> and uh and and we we do this sort of we'll have many of these different filters that hopefully learn to extract different kinds of information um the kinds of things that they eventually learn are sort of to detect edges in the image to detect different kinds of textures can they tell the difference between like the texture of a car and the texture of like like a dog's fur those are the kinds of things that they they in practice end up learning and so we'll use these filters, which are much smaller matrices. We'll use them sort of over and over. Um, we'll sort of pool together. So we'll sort of decrease the resolution of the image as we add more and more of these filters. And that's why we get this thin, wide image that gets kind of collapsed into sort of more and more cube-like rectangles. And then they become rectangles that are stretched out in a different direction. And then finally, we'll act with some kind of fully connected network, like we talked about earlier. Um, and that's how we act, that's how we sort of learn uh, to do well at image Um And so that's the kind of structure that Alex and Atta's first network that did well on ImageNet had, and we have pretty similar ideas uh, up, up until the present. Um, that's one way that we can learn symmetry is sort of running, is using translation variants and running the same little matrix over sort of the whole image. Um, another case where it's natural to use symmetry is uh, sequential data. <clears throat> so many, many, many different kinds of interesting data are, uh, uh, are in a sequence. Uh, maybe one of the most interesting examples is language. Um, but of course, like um, another example is like if you have some neural network that's trying to describe an agent moving around in the world, then they, they should, their, their experience of the world, like my experience of the world is some time series of moment to moment to moment um, doing, uh, doing different things. Um, and so it's very natural to have some sort of recurrent network where <clears throat> it takes in data at each sort of time. And that time may be like, like a sequential index, like, like the word in a sentence, like the first word, second word, third word, or it might literally be time. It takes in uh, uh, information at any given time, and it processes that information and produces an output. But it also passes something to itself uh, at the next time step. Um, so uh, these are often called RNNs. And the most famous and widely used example of them is called an LSTM, um, long short-term memory. Um, an LSTM basically uh, 
has some inner workings inside the box that hopefully allow it to kind of remember things more effectively. Um, why, would, why would that be a problem? Well, just, uh, just by, by linear algebra, um, this, this neural net is taking in a vector as an input and acting on that vector with a matrix and then a nonlinearity. Maybe it's doing something a bit more complicated, but that's the basic idea of what it's doing. And then it's passing that information along to itself. Now, <clears throat> if I have a matrix and I act with it many, 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 many times, then a thing that we all know is that if I take a matrix to a power, I'm going to eventually be dominated by the largest eigenvalue of that matrix. If I have like a, a matrix that's nearly orthogonal, then um, I can sort of preserve some information for quite a while. But I have this issue that, uh, that typically I'm going to sort of throw away all the information except in the kind of uh, eigenspaces associated with the largest eigenvalues. And so um, the LSTM was, uh, was basically introduced to try to avoid this problem. I mean, it doesn't really solve this problem, but, uh, but, it, but it helps a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and so here, uh, what's the advantage of these networks? Well, the advantage of these networks is maybe at each time step, we have a vector that's getting input that's like a thousand dimensional vector. And so if we were to take sort of all of the time steps together, maybe we have a hundred thousand dimensional vectors. And then we're in this scenario uh, as described earlier with image network, where the input vector is just too big. So this is a way of using translation symmetry in time or translation symmetry along a sequence. <clears throat> uh, to try to uh, uh, avoid that problem. Um, so these are two extremely common, famous architectures uh, that have been wide use for a long time. Convolutional neural networks from the last slide and recurrent networks uh, on, on this slide. Um, so <clears throat> how should we sort of dive into, uh, into the rest of the field to talk about more recent things, more different accomplishments? Um, so I think there's sort of three levels of abstraction. Um, if you're like giving a talk to uh, 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 the general public, <clears throat> I mean, a fun thing to do is just list lots of things that you can do with ML and what is accomplished. Um, a second uh, level of abstraction um, is to sort of uh, describe how to convert some interesting, important problems into complicated function approximation tasks. So if you're someone who wants to use machine learning for a particular thing you're doing, um, really all you need to do is convert the problem you're working on and trying to solve into a task of uh, uh, finding a, basically finding a function that you can approximate um, that does your task. So if you, can, if you can phrase your task in terms of, I need a function that takes as inputs images and outputs labels, or I, I need a task that uh, uh, takes in sort of an image of the world and outputs like uh, what to type on a keyboard. If you can sort of repackage your task in some way like this with input and outputs, then you can, you can learn to apply machine learning to it. Um, a third level of abstraction is you can classify tasks based on what the connection is between uh, the model parameters and success. Um, so this is kind of a, an elaboration on, on point two. Um, the question is sort of how close is your data to uh, the, the function that you need to learn? And this is what causes, uh, uh, in, in the machine learning community, um, people break up machine learning into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And the real distinction between those three ideas is how, uh, basically how labeled your data is or, or to what extent your data already encodes um, what success means. Um, so I'm gonna sort of go through a bunch of different uh, interesting examples um, now and sort of talk about sort of all three of these levels of abstraction, sort of whether they're supervised, unsupervised reinforcement, um, and, uh, and, and in various different domains. <clears throat> so the domain that, that maybe is most famous um, uh, uh, in machine learning is actually one of the, one of the domains that's, that's most difficult. It's the domain of, uh, like, say, playing a game. And when you play a game, you really need to use reinforcement learning. 
Um, and so the way that we formalize games is as uh, every game has some kind of game state. For Go, that's what the layout of the board is, where all of the stones are. Um, for Atari, that's like, what is the screen and maybe what happened in the last few minutes uh, of playing Atari. And then there are a set of actions, actions that the agent that's playing the game can take in order to try to do well. Um, so in Atari, that means like, I don't know, moving a spaceship around and shooting. In Go, it means like where you place a stone on the board. Um, and of course, I mean, really in both of those cases, there's some sort of combinatorially exponentially growing number of options and configurations you can get to. Um, there's some sort of tree of options. It might be a continuum of options as in Atari. Um, and, uh, and of course, abstractly, this is all that like living life as a human really is. Um, living life as a human, you have a state and you choose what to do and uh, maybe you get rewarded, maybe you get punished, um, maybe you enjoy your life, maybe you don't. Um, this is a very, very, very general framework. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, there's two common approaches. One is that you learn what's called a policy that's always parameterized by pi, which takes a state of the game and outputs an action. The other way that you can, you can do this is you can try to learn the value of actions. So this is always parameterized by Q, so it's called Q learning. This is just some cryptic uh, notation that everyone in, in the field uses. So you learn a Q function, which says, what is the expected reward that I'm going to get in a given state if I take a particular action? If I knew this Q function exactly, if I knew the, the optimal Q function exactly, then I would just always choose the action that maximizes my expected reward, and that's how I would do well at, uh, at the game. <clears throat> so this is reinforcement learning. The thing that makes it very different from classifying images is that each individual move, um, you don't really know whether you did well or not. You play a Go game and you either win or lose, but winning and losing is maybe a hundred or a few hundred moves away from the first few moves that you're making or the moves that you're making in the middle of the game. So it's very, very hard to know whether or not your, uh, the action you chose, either via the policy or via this Q function, was the right action. Um, you really have to <clears throat> play to the end of the game, see whether you won or lost in order to, in order to know. <clears throat> And so the way reinforcement lear learning works is <clears throat> you play a lot of games and take various actions. At first, your actions are basically random. <clears throat> and you reinforce uh, the actions that led to winning games. And you sort of unreinforce, you de-enforce the actions that led you to lose. <clears throat> but this has this monumental, I mean, at first, very uh, seemingly insurmountable problem of attribution. You have no idea whether it was a move you made at move 50 or move 150 that led to you winning or losing. And uh, <clears throat> that's really just a big problem with reinforcement learning. And um, the thing that makes, as, I, as I'm saying, the thing that makes it hard and different is that the reward you get is very distant from the thing you're actually doing. The thing you're actually doing is making moves, but the reward only comes at the end. Um, <clears throat> if you had, say, an expert to tell you what to do, then you could turn reinforcement learning into supervised learning because your expert could tell you, oh, that move you made was bad, that move you made was good, that move you made was bad. Um, but typically in this, in this context, we, we don't have that. Um, and that's why, it's, that's why it's reinforcement learning. Um, now, another kind of learning um, is unsupervised learning. And uh, naively, this sounds at first like it's the hardest problem in machine learning. Um, the problem is really just to understand the world. In a certain sense, you might say it's the problem of being a physicist. You're trying to figure out what the rules are that govern the world. <clears throat> and you're just presented with an enormous amount of data about the world, and you're trying to learn how to, how to understand that, uh, that information and maybe more, make predictions about what's going to happen in the future in the world. Um, so this is unsupervised learning. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and how do you even get started with this task? Well, the way that, the way that uh, we do it in machine learning is we formalize this as determining what the underlying probability distribution of the world is. Um, so uh, 
that's it. We're trying to learn the probability distribution of any given configuration in the world. Um, this is a, a very deep and important problem. Um, and so ML researchers have applied it to try to interpolate between celebrities um, because it's, it's, it's just, uh, that's, that's one of the most interesting and deepest things that you can do in the world. And so uh, we have interpolations between uh, various different famous faces. So this is one of the one of the one of the one of the accomplishments of machine learning is being able to interpolate between celebrities. Um, that's that's a joke, but uh, because this is a Zoom call, I don't even know if it's funny. Um, and you get really interesting, cool outputs from this. So one example, I mean, this is super primitive machine learning research from a long time ago. But one example is that uh, uh, you embed faces of celebrities in a vector space. So that means you can take like smiling woman and subtract uh, a <clears throat> uh, neutral woman and add a neutral man and get a smiling man. Because like there's a vector for smiling woman and a vector for neutral woman. Their difference is smiling. And if you add smiling to a neutral man, you get a smiling man. So this is pretty cool. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to say that uh, I was uh, laughing quite hard at that joke of yours. <laughs> okay. uh, secondly, um, so so there are obvious similarities to this uh, sort of vector space uh, structure and uh, you know quantum mechanics. So uh, is there uh, so here what you have is like the superposition principle is already there in play, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Right. I mean, you're taking your vector space. In addition to that, like, is there a sense in which uh, one can have, let's say, interference phenomena uh, between uh, different different possible, uh, you know, so to speak, states, quote unquote? Um, I'm, I'm just I'm just speculating. Sure. I mean, I think so. So a thing that I haven't, I mean, I haven't played with. Uh, I mean, this is some particular model from actually a while ago. I mean, it's from, uh, I think it's from like 2016. So it's just ancient history. Um, uh, it's, it's like a classic, uh, uh, it's like, it's like a physics paper from 1850. Um, the, uh, like you can imagine taking smiling woman and met, subtracting neutral woman and asking, what does that give you? Um, and presumably that will give you something kind of weird and garbled because, uh, you're kind of interfering those things off of each other. Um, so I think, I think that's, uh, that's a sense. Um, this, this phenomenon is very, very widely seen in machine learning. So another example of this is with words. Um, I, maybe I'll, I, I think I have a slide for this in a, in a few slides. But, but like, you can add like, uh, uh, you could take queen plus man minus woman and get king or something like that. So, um, and this isn't really something that you're uh, trying to make happen. It's basically just because these models are all working in giant vector spaces. And so, uh, and so in order for them to sort of prove like, like efficient, efficiently encode information, I think they sort of have to do this. Um, otherwise, they'd end up having to sort of like find different points in this space in some uh, in some really really complicated way. And so I think this is just sort of the simplest way that they can learn to do things. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot a lot to explore with this this kind of stuff. Um, All right, thanks. Sure. So uh, this is an example that isn't ancient history. Um, when I first gave a talk about this subject. Um, this was a very new result. So this is like, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing you're supposed to see is that in the last slide, these images are like not that great. Um, this is from uh, 2018. Um, this was a really big uh, model of the same type as on the last slide. It was just a bigger model with more data, um, which will be a theme that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and uh, you, can see, you can see you can like interpolate between a shark and a dog or a dog and a bird. And like the thing that's kind of amazing here is not only can you do this interpolation, but like uh, a lot of the things in between look like kind of reasonable. I mean, they don't look great. I mean, some of them obviously have sort of mistakes that are not real, but like if you asked like an artist to try to interpolate between a shark and a dog, um, like, I don't know, it's hard to imagine them doing a lot better than, than this. So it's, it's, I mean, there are two levels of, of commentary. One is this is really cool and kind of scary that it's so good. The other is that uh, 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 the model really has to learn a lot of information about 
the world in order to be able to do this well. Um, and something that I've worked on and that uh, if there's time, maybe we'll, we'll be able to talk about more is language models. So in language models, uh, the way that, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that you uh, uh, learn language is you just say, um, what's the probability of the next word given the first N words? So <clears throat> that is something, so naively learning language is unsupervised learning. It's saying, learn the world, learn all of the things that humans talk about in language. <clears throat> but this really breaks language down into a basically a supervised task because given uh, 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 Shakespeare's complete works, um, you can look at the first 10 words and try to predict the 11th. You can work, then look at the first 11 words and try to predict the 12th, etc. And so this is called autoregressive prediction. And you just learn a model that looks at the first n words and tries to predict the next. And you just optimize this uh, cross entropy loss or log likelihood of words. Um, and the first models that did this for a while were called, uh, were LSTM models because words are naturally a sequence. Um, but there are better models that, uh, uh, that do this now. Um, and of course you can do all kinds of other things. So uh, you actually don't really need to do it this way. This is actually kind of uh, dated. But um, if you wanna translate between languages, what you have is, you can have an encoder, which reads he loved to eat, and then that makes some kind of high dimensional vector s. It sends that high dimensional vector s to a decoder, and then that decoder writes uh, he loved to eat in German as well as it can. And if you have a lot of text that involves English and German translations, then you can just train uh, your model to take English and output German. Um, and this is this example of like the these learned embedding spaces being cool. Um, you can see basically that like the difference between say Spain and Madrid is basically the same vector as the difference between Italy and Rome and Germany and Berlin, etc. Um, and so this is this is pretty cool. This is how translation systems, as a lot of them still work this way, but uh, but but they don't actually have to. Um, now. Uh, uh, I've been working a lot on language um, for a variety of reasons. One is that like if you can, if you understand language perfectly, then basically you're you're intelligent. Um, uh, that that's that's one reason why I think it's important. But uh, there's been a lot of progress in language in the last few years, and I think maybe the most important advance in machine learning in the last three years was the introduction of a model that people call the transformer, which is based on self attention, and it processes information in particular process sequences like 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 sentences and, and paragraphs in a different way from the LSTM. It doesn't process it sequentially. It really kind of looks at everything at once. And this is supposed to illustrate, this image is supposed to illustrate what it's doing. All it's doing is uh, is attend is deciding sort of what it should attend to to make predictions. So we have the FBI is chasing a criminal on the run and uh, uh, and so for example, on the fourth line, we have the FBI is chasing, chasing's in red, and um, the model, therefore, is trying to predict chasing. And the sentence that it's seen so far is the FBI is, and so uh, uh, the is is important because it tells it something about the tense of the verb and things like that. The fact that it's the FBI is important for the fact that uh, uh, it's chasing. I mean, the FBI chases criminals. It might do a bunch of other things to criminals. But like, if the second word of the sentence had been chef, if it was the chef is, then it would probably be cooking. And so the model sort of attends to, using attention, the, uh, the word FBI while it's trying to decide what verb it should use. Um, and this is sort of intuitively how these models work. They literally sort of take a linear combination. When they're trying to decide about chasing or they're trying to decide about criminal, they look at some processed linear combination of the first uh, N words of the sentence. They, rate, they weight those words based on how relevant they are to the decision they're about to make. And then they use that information to, to make the decision. And uh, I mean, this model is not really that complicated, though it's more complicated than an LSTM or a convolutional neural network. Um, and uh, not only can it do uh, uh, language, but it can really do almost anything. Um, and, uh, uh, and people are using it for sort of everything. Um, and 
the, the, the techni one technical reason why it's so great is that when you look, when you look at language in this way, um, you avoid the problem I mentioned earlier. If you have a recurrent network, then it tends to forget things that were hundreds or thousands of words in the past just by the nature of matrix multiplication, forgetting things um, because it's dominated by the, the largest eigenvalues. Here you can really process a thousand words or even 10,000 words at the same time. <clears throat> and the model kind of uh, will attend to the things that are relevant and important and use that information uh, appropriately. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I've already been talking for more than an hour or certainly at least an hour. So uh, in order, for the purposes of, of time, I, don't, I won't go into this. But uh, these are the two critical equations for self-attention. Basically, you make some sort of key and query, and then you use some softmax, which is just this uh, sort of exponential weighting to kind of decide at a given point, like at the point of criminal, what part of the past is most relevant for deciding that you're going to write criminal rather than something else. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is an example of uh, a modern language model writing. So the text that's in gray, the text that's in sort of this orangish brownish color um, is copied from the Johns Hopkins website. And then everything else is just what the model thought would be a natural thing to write following from that text. Um, so uh, uh, maybe I'll leave this up later. But I mean, the model ends up, I mean, this is something about the Henry A. Roll and physics department. So it decided, oh, it's natural to sort of talk about the history of the department. So it says a little history. <clears throat> it says Henry A. Rowland was professor of physics from 1879 to 1897. He was the founder and first head of the department. He was born in Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> he left high school at age 16, took a job at a machinist. He later became a machinist, master machinist, superintendent of the shop, and the inventor of several tools. These experiences provided him with the discipline of conscience prepared him for further training in physics. He began his education at Johns Hopkins and graduated <clears throat> uh, with a degree in physics, then pursued postgraduate work in Germany, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is all entirely written by a machine. Um, and uh, so, <clears throat> so now I want to talk, uh, I guess I still have half an hour, about relevant scales in machine learning. And hopefully I'll get to talk a little bit about scaling laws in machine learning. Um, so I already kind of talked about ImageNet. It has 6 times 5 to the 10 pixels per image, a million images. Um, <clears throat> uh, Typically, uh, the first models that did well at this had sort of 60 million parameters. Um, and basically, you can guesstimate the amount of computation a model does when it trains by multiplying the size of the data set by the number of parameters in the model um, and maybe multiplying that by 10 or 100 or so. And that gives you a training that requires about 10 to the 19 floating point operations. Um, uh, and in what follows, I'll often measure computation in petaflop days. A petaflop is 10 to the 15 flops uh, floating point operations. Um, and uh, uh, often flops means flops per second. Um, so a petaflop day is 10 to the 15 operations per second times a day. And that's like almost 10 to the 20 operations. So you see we're getting close to Avogadro's number. Um, this is crazy. Uh, we couldn't have done it 20 or 30 years ago, but we're doing it all the time. Um, for language modeling, um, uh, I guess we can get some intuition. Uh, a common benchmark a few years ago was the billion word benchmark. A billion words takes a person about 10 years of continuous reading to read at typical speeds. Um, a language model would often read this data set, I don't know, 10 to 100 times. Um, these are some models that had billions of, uh, like, order a billion parameters. Um, but we can really go to, to, to the last few months. GPT-3, which is the model that I worked on, that's built from a transformer, um, it worked on a data set of order 200 billion words. Um, it really just read all of those words about once. Um, so it read 200 billion words once. That's, I guess, uh, I don't know, like uh, 2,000 years of a person reading. Um, this model has 175 billion parameters. Um, so then you can see sort of compute measured in petaflop days. Um, this got to about a, a few thousand petaflop days, which is, I think, very, very close to an Avogadro's number uh, of floating point operations. Um, and this is, uh, this is a plot from scaling laws. Something that you'll notice is that uh, uh, you train models at different parameters sizes, and this is sort of the loss of the model, um, uh, which is basically a measure of how it's doing. And fascinatingly, uh, all of these models, sort of if you, uh, 
if you sort of look at how they're doing, they all fall on a, a line in a log log plot, which is a, a power law. Um, so we'll talk about that later. But the quantity of computation here is astronomical, and it's going to going to keep growing. Um, uh, let's see. Um, having issues. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, okay. For some reason, things froze. Um, uh, you could talk about Atari. These, uh, it, it'll, the compute will be less now than this last slide, but uh, models that, that learn to play things like Atari are typically smaller, so then they have a order of a million parameters versus the roughly 200 billion on the last slide. Um, uh, you, you, you learn by uh, looking at lots of frames. Um, in order to learn to play Atari, you play Atari for days of weeks or weeks of straight play. Um, uh, and a, a problem with these models, so, so these models play for sort of weeks with a million parameters, something like 10 to the five seconds. Um, uh, these models are sort of, uh, uh, I mean, just, just sort of an aside, these models, they'll learn to play one Atari game, but they don't necessarily learn to play other Atari games. So it's not like you learn how to play Pong and suddenly you're good at Super Mario. Um, uh, this problem of sort of transferring between tasks is, is a limitation of, of these models. But you can learn to be extremely good at any given, uh, any given name. Um, <clears throat> scaling this up to sort of, I don't know, a year ago, um, there's this famous game called Dota, which is one of the most popular games in the world. It's a multiplayer strategy game. Um, uh, OpenAI uh, was able to sort of beat a lot of basically all of the world's experts at this game. <clears throat> um, there are professionals who play this game. Um, they use something like 256 GPUs and 100,000 CPUs. They played for about 10 to the 10 seconds uh, per day while training. Um, they train with batches of a million different experiences of playing the game. Um, each experience was a 20,000 dimensional vector. Um, the game's about 30 minutes, so there's something like 20,000 moves per game. Um, and they used a model for this, which is not so big. It was like uh, uh, something like, I guess, a, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 million parameter LSTM. Um, so there are big numbers here, um, enormous numbers compared to Atari. Um, and scaling up, you can sort of do well at, at this kind of task. Um, some more trends here um, uh, for OpenAI. So this is the growth of compute um, in machine learning for a, a ver various different problems that it's been applied to. Um, and so you see, interestingly, that from 2012 to 2018, the total amount of computation used in state-of-the-art examples grew by like six orders of magnitude. Um, so the amount of computations being applied to AI is increasing very quickly. This isn't Moore's law. This is the fact that there is uh, uh, more and more money um, being poured in to, to do this research. Um, another interesting trend uh, is these models are also improving. They're getting more efficient. Um, this is some plot of like um, AlexNet was this very, very, very first uh, neural network to do well on ImageNet. And this is a question of how much computation do you need to do as well as AlexNet today? And uh, that's actually also shrinking exponentially. So models are getting better and more and more computation is being poured into the field. Um, so uh, this, this sort of uh, leads us to uh, a question. Um, <clears throat> what do you want to do? What is, the, what is the sort of philosophy that leads to progress in this field? And um, there, this is a big debate. Um, in the past, um, uh, the question is sort of uh, how much information or structure do humans impose on machine learning algorithms versus how much is learned? And uh, the old fashioned philosophy was sort of all of it's coming from people. Um, the goal was to kind of hand engineer features that imitate human reasoning and human processing. Um, <clears throat> another view that in between is that you have uh, some hard-coded features, but most of what the, 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 the algorithm is doing is learned. And the other extreme is sort of uh, basically you don't hard-code anything into the algorithm. You basically just supply a huge amount of computation and a lot of training data. Basically, all you do is to provide some kind of universal architecture that's able to learn and a loss function, and you let the model kind of learn everything. 
And uh, this spectrum from humans providing all of the insights to machines learning all of the insights themselves, um, uh, I think is a big uh, 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 question in terms of what approaches people take, um, et cetera. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, I mean, my, my personal view is, is very much in the, in the second camp that uh, really you wanna let the computers learn themselves. Um, so this is this, so Richard Sutton is a famous pioneer in the field. He developed a lot of the initial reinforcement learning um, a long time ago, and he's been working on ML for, for decades. And he's, he has this essay called The Bitter Lesson, <clears throat> where he says that the biggest lesson from 70 years of AI research is that general method, methods that leverage computation are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin. Um, <clears throat> and the second general point is that, uh, the actual contents of minds are tremendously irredeemably complex. We should stop trying to find simple ways to think about the contents of minds, such as simple ways to think about space, objects, agents, and symmetries. All of these are part of an arbitrary, intrinsic, intrinsically complex outside world. They are not what should be built in as their complexity is endless. Instead, we should build in only the meta methods that can find and capture this arbitrary complexity. And I think that uh, uh, these lessons about what works um, and the fact that a kind of meta approach to learning is what's important. We as humans take this meta approach where we kind of just design uh, very basic features of architecture and loss, and then we provide a lot of computation and data, I think connects to why uh, all of this is very, very natural for physics. So, I mean, uh, maybe a, a, a controversial question you can ask is, are neural networks even algorithms? So algorithms are what computer scientists study. And uh, uh, I think a prototypical algorithm is sorting. Sorting is something that you can really easily analyze. It's really sort of thinking about how to optimize sort as a math problem. You can understand everything that's going on. You can discuss the worst case, the best case, the average case. You can prove rigorous theorems about it. The ingredients are simple and visible and amenable to detailed analysis. That's what like an algorithm really is. Um, I think neural networks really aren't algorithms. Um, they're, they're much more like physical systems, like condensed matter systems, um, for example, snowflake. So I really like this quote from a friend of mine, Dario Amadai. If you look at the fractal structure of a snowflake, you might think that whoever made it did something impossibly intr intricate and difficult, but that building it piece by piece must somehow be possible because somehow someone did it and made a snowflake. But of course, in fact, both statements are false. The way that you make a snowflake is not to think in terms of its pieces, but to know the laws of physics, to have enough raw material like data and ML, to have a large enough chamber, um, and to set the temperature, pressure, and humidity correctly and wait for long enough. Furthermore, this is really the only way you can make snowflakes. Trying to piece together a single one from little bits of ice is, is actually hopeless. Um, so a snowflake is this emergent pattern that comes about with the right ingredients, and I think that's really what machine learning is, is it's about uh, putting the right ingredients together so that you get kind of the outcome you want rather than hand engineering. And really, as I said, that's much more like a condensed matter system than uh, uh, a traditional algorithm. So I think, so, I think uh, there's, just, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, be more concise, I guess one could simply say more is different. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, I include more is different in a discussion section of a paper. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, so yeah, so this is more just sort of saying the same stuff, um, that it's natural to have, uh, uh, to work on machine learning as physicists. It's really, uh, in many ways, more like a physics problem. Um, I wanna briefly talk about why now and then move on to the scaling law stuff. Um, so a very interesting comparison you can make is you can ask sort of, uh, how big and powerful are machine learning systems we're studying compared to the to brains? Um, this is grabbed from Wikipedia. There's sort of the number of uh, uh, <clears throat> neurons in a brain. I think the real connection between machine learning and uh, the brain, the naive order of magnitude connection at least, is to connect synapses to parameters. Um, a synapse transfers sort of a little bit of information from neuron to neuron. Parameters are these sort of entries in these matrices that take one input and provide a different output at a new layer. <clears throat> so I think that's the, that's the connection. 
And interestingly, the human brain has order 10 to the 15 uh, synapses. Um, and that means that uh, because synapses spike order once per second, the human brain runs at about a petaflop. Um, so <clears throat> if you want to train a human brain, you have a lifetime, I don't know, maybe 30 years, that's order 10 to the 19, 9 seconds. And so you can sort of summarize a human life as, uh, at least in the brain, as 10 to the 24 uh, floating point operations of computation. Of course, this is controversial, but I think this is actually basically the right order of magnitude. Um, and an interesting fact is that this level of computation is something that is coming online as available to large organizations doing machine le learning research uh, right now. Um, uh, and you can imagine, for example, if you can ex do an experiment uh, with a, as much computation as a human lifetime in a day or two, look at what the result is, and then iterate, maybe you can make a lot of progress and, and discover uh, 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 really incredible things. And so this is, again, the same trend plot. <clears throat> um, I first made this plot a year or so ago, um, but now we're already sort of at, at this, this higher level of compute. And in just a few more years, we'll be able to run, there will be experiments that can run sort of many human lifetimes of compute. So I think that's, that's sort of an interesting observation, it's not, uh, not conclusive, about why you might expect really crazy things to be happening in machine learning now is we're really, for the first time, getting to, to the scale of computation uh, that the brain does to learn about the world. Um, and I mean, I, I, I'm happy to talk about this more, but I think one of the reasons why I'm working on this field is I think that uh, ML is really going to change things in, in society very quickly. Um, even if it didn't make a lot more progress, I think the existing technologies are already going to have a big effect on society. They already are um, in ways that we read about in the news. But I think that actually there's just going to be a lot more progress. Um, and uh, I think it's super scary and uncertain whether these powerful systems are going to be deployed in ways that are ethical, that are going to improve human welfare broadly. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this has both a policy component and a technical component. And a technical component there's a question of whether we're really going to train ML systems that do what we want, that are aligned with our values, that aren't just trying to say, get you to make, to click on more ads on the internet or, or watch YouTube longer. Um, and also that they're going to be sort of unbiased, they're going to be robust to changes in, in, in what they see. So I think there are a huge number of safety and ethical issues. This is a main, this is a major reason why I'm thinking about this field. Um, and I think it's something I really think is going to be a huge issue because I think this is just going to get better and better. Um, so uh, for the last 10 minutes, I'll try to talk about uh, work I've done that's really uh, not so different from things that you might think about in physics, um, scaling laws for these neural models. Um, so really, I mean, it's, it's very poorly understood why ML works so well. It's not very well understood what really matters in machine learning and what's uh, what doesn't in order to get these systems to work. Um, so what I want to show you is that there are actually precise scaling laws for how well these systems work as a function of the number of model parameters, the size of the data set, uh, and the total compute used for training. Um, and actually, it turns out that a lot of the details don't matter very much aside from these ingredients. Um, and this is what sort of was uh, this was relevant for, for OpenAI building these, this most recent language model, GPT-3. Um, GPT-3 is, is noteworthy because it writes, I mean, a very, very, very scary thing is that it writes news articles that humans are not able to distinguish from news articles written by people at better than chance level. So uh, GPT-3, if you give it a prompt, like write a news article about this subject, or write an article, and if you, if you go out and you ask 100 humans, was that article written by a person or by a machine, they, I think their accuracy in discriminating is like 52%. Um, so that's where we're already at right now. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about this, this more physics-y thing. So really, this can be, the, the information here can be encoded in some plots. So, um, uh, these are plots, these are experimental data points for what happens when you train a language model on either different amounts of data, that's the center plot, 
language models with different numbers of parameters on the right. And just uh, with a constraint or, or measuring the overall amount of computation you did to train the model. And um, <clears throat> in all cases, the labeled input is the only thing that's being limited. So when you limit the data set size here, you're taking a really, really, really big model and training it to do as well as possible with limited data set. When you're studying the parameter dependence, you're giving the model as much data as it could possibly want, uh, but you're varying how big the model is. And in the compute plot, you're giving the model as much data as it wants, and you're just training it and, and measuring how well it's doing as a function of uh, the amount of compute you've used. And so, I mean, I find this data extremely striking. Um, the data is, like I said, it's, it's as good as the kind of data you'd expect in some very well done condensed matter paper studying some new material. Uh, maybe it's better than a lot, of, uh, a lot of the data we're able to get in condensed matter. One of the amazing, one of the great things about doing quote unquote experiments in machine learning is that you have uh, uh, complete control over everything that happens. You can measure anything you want um, to whatever accuracy you want. So uh, that's, that's really a benefit. And so <laughs> what it seems is there are these power law scaling laws. So what's being plotted here, the, the y-axis is in always case the test loss. That is a model for in language of how well you're doing at predicting the next word. If you can predict the next word, then you can write words, right? Like if I can predict what the next word is gonna be in a sentence, then I can write that word. And then I can predict the next word and the next word and the next word. That's what allows these models to write. Um, and, uh, uh, and so you see that we're doing very well and they're extremely simple scaling laws. Um, the difference between the top plot on the left and the bottom plot on the left is the top plot on the left is from this paper that I wrote um, that came out in January. The bottom plot on the left is an updated version of the top plot from the GPT-3 paper. The only difference really is that in the top plot, uh, the trend ends at order one uh, petaflop days of compute, whereas in the right, we extend the trend out to uh, a few thousand petaflop days of compute. You see that the trend basically is just continuing. So that's just saying that you can train bigger and bigger models with more and more computation, and they'll just keep doing better at, uh, at language model. Um, so there are also multivariable scaling laws. So you can imagine limiting the amount of data and the model size. And we found a very simple sort of ansatz, which is listed at the bottom, um, for how, how well models do as a function of both data set size and model size. It doesn't work perfectly, but it works very, very well. Um, the one reason why you might care about this in practice is it tells you about overfitting. Um, <clears throat> You can ask, how much data do I need for a given model size to not overfit very much? <clears throat> and um, on the right, I've basically collapsed the, the curves on the left to the question of how much are you overfitting on the data? And you see that there's just an extremely smooth trend. It's very predictable for how much overfitting uh, you see. <clears throat> so these systems really obey uh, very, very simple scaling laws that have been, I mean, they're only like, five papers that talk about this phenomenon. I mean, even though machine learning is a huge field, this is the kind of question that physicists ask. It's not the kind of question these people ask. They know that bigger models sort of do better, but they had no idea until the last, until, until these few papers came out that it was this predictable um, or that there really might be some theory underlying this, uh, this phenomenon. Um, and conversely, a lot of the things that people in the field of ML care about a lot don't matter that much. So um, the top plots are a bunch of different uh, ways that you can change the architecture of the model. You can change how many layers it has versus how big its vector space is. And you can say, do that while keeping the total number of parameters fixed. And you see that performance changes. Um, so the middle plot is looking at sort of number of layers versus size of vector space. But basically, you can change these things by like an order of magnitude, and performance doesn't really change that much. So I mean, I think this is, this is very striking. What matters is how many parameters your model has. It doesn't really matter exactly how those parameters are, are, are presented. Um, another example that's really, uh, I, I find, super striking, um, I told you that all of these uh, very powerful current contemporary models are transformers. 
Um, but you can also use LSTMs. So the blue curve in the bottom left is data from transformers as a function of the number of parameters. There's a very smooth scaling law. <clears throat> you can see that the benefit of using a transformer versus an LSTM is mostly just an overall constant. Um, you can see that these lines are almost parallel. It's just that uh, the transformer is doing a little bit better for every given model size. So I think the introduction of transformers is really like maybe the biggest advance in the last uh, 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 in the last three or four years in machine learning. But it's really just giving you an overall constant factor on a scaling law that was already there for uh, for LSTMs. Um, so I'm sort of out of time. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit uh, about uh, uh, why this might be true. Um, no, you are not out of time. Oh, I'm not out of time. OK. OK. So uh, I'll just the last few slides, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a th about a theory um, for why these scaling laws might be true. It's an incredibly dumb theory that uh, uh, very, very simple. Um, it's certainly not getting at all of the complexity, um, but it gives sort of the right answer. Um, so this is some work that I did with my student, Yudkar Sharma, um, at Hopkins. It doesn't involve any big fancy AI labs. Um, so why would you find that uh, your function approximation improves as a power law with the number of parameters? That's the question we were trying to, trying to address. Assuming we have infinite data, et cetera. Um, so the idea here is just what I wrote on the slide. The key idea is that neural models map the data to some manifold with some intrinsic dimension. So your data might uh, really be something, uh, something like language. It might be images. It might be something like that. But there's this idea that really the model is mapping the data to some manifold that's much lower dimensional than, say, the inputs. The inputs might have thousands or millions of dimensions, but you map the data to some lower dimensional manifold, some complicated curved, ma curved data manifold. It has some dimension d. And then all you're doing to sort of uh, improve performance on that data manifold is sort of cutting that manifold up into smaller and smaller pieces. So that's why I have this picture of a cube that I'm carving up into subcubes. Um, so if the underlying data varies continuously on this manifold, then you might think that what matters is the size of these subregions rather than their number. So basically, if you have some continuous function and you're approximating it by chopping it up into small and smaller pieces, basically the size of the pieces determines how well you're doing. Um, but notice that if you shrink the size of these regions by, say, a factor of two, then if you're in dimension d, then you need two to the d times more parameters, basically, because you have to sort of determine the value of the function in each of these little subcubes. Um, and this is only going to sort of improve your performance by like a constant factor. Um, and if you do sort of three lines of math uh, uh, concerning this, this idea, then uh, you learn that basically your loss, which is how well you're doing, is going to scale as 1 over the number of parameters n that you have to a, an exponent, which is of order four over uh, the dimension. And the four depends on what exactly your loss function is, but for most of the losses we use, it's four. Um, and so you learn that, uh, that you get this kind of scaling. Uh, you get a power law scaling, and the power is four over the dimension of the data manifold. So that's the idea. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it works surprisingly well. I don't know. I'm a little bit suspicious of how well it works, but this is these are a bunch of experiments that my student and I uh, uh, did in the last uh, few months. So um, uh, you can test this theory by uh, either controlling the dimension of the data by making up fake data or by measuring it. There's some, uh, there's some algorithms to try to measure the, the data of a manifold in a high dimensional space. And you can plot four over the exponent you find versus the dimension. And for a bunch of very simple data sets and for uh, teacher-student examples where basically we, we, we generated the data ourselves and had control over it, um, there does seem to be a really nice strong correlation between uh, uh, the, this, the scaling exponent and the dimension of the data manifold. So uh, uh, I mean, I don't think that it's clear that this works in all cases, um, or at the very least for 
for really powerful modern models, it's harder to measure this intrinsic dimension. Um, but it seems like maybe this, this, this is at least a very coarse, very basic zeroth order approximation to what's going on. Um, so not only is there interesting data in ML, like these scaling laws that are empirical, but I think there's a lot of sort of theory to be developed to, to understand what's going on. Um, maybe we can extend this theory to data set size scaling if we assume that models are essentially just interpolating between data points on the data manifold. Um, uh, maybe we can extend it to compute scaling, but we really don't know how. That would be really valuable, I think. We don't understand compute scaling at all. It would have something to do with sort of what's actually going on in the learning process, not just the sort of endpoint of learning. Um, so anyway, these are, these are some things that we're, we're thinking about. Um, and then the last couple of slides uh, before I conclude, I'll just tell you a little bit about GBG3, which I said was partly inspired by these scaling laws. People at OpenAI said, well, if these scaling laws are really true, we can just build a bigger model with better data and, uh, and do, do impressive things. Um, so I think the coolest thing about GBG3, this very powerful language model, is that uh, you can really just tell it what you want it to do, and it'll do a pretty good job of doing that. So that's what this plot shows um, uh, for, for three different model sizes. The, the blue line is the full GPG-3, which has 170 billion parameters. Um, so you can ask it to do something like, uh, like answer a multiple choice question. I mean, an example is like the SATs. So in the US, we take this test called the SATs um, to get into college. And there are various like reading comprehension problems. There are like analogy problems, other things like that. And it's never really solved those kinds of problems before. You didn't tune it to solve those problems. But you can say, okay, I want you to like solve these analogy problems or multiple choice problems. And what's being shown in this plot is the number of examples of these kinds of problems that you provide it with. Um, and there are two different, the, the dashed line is where you just give it examples and ask it to, to do as well as it can. The solid line is where you construct it. You say, these are analogies. Please choose the like completion of the analogy that uh, makes the most sense. I don't know. You say something like that to, to the model. If you give it instructions in language, it, uh, it does way better um, than if you don't give it instructions. And the more examples that you give it, the better it does. This is, I think, just like a person. It's not as good as a person. Maybe a person only needs one or two examples. Um, but uh, but there's a, it really can sort of do pretty much any task that you can describe and that can be done by just writing um, or choosing, choosing examples, multiple choice questions, et cetera, um, uh, in this way. And the very, very precise trends with the loss. So the loss, remember, is sort of like the, the just evaluates how well the model is doing at predicting the next word, um, uh, lead to smooth improvement at all these other tasks. So uh, the middle one is, is SAT analogies. Um, so these are, this is this college entrance test. Um, and the average college applicant gets 58% right. So this model is getting like 65% right. So it's sort of doing better than the average college applicant even though it wasn't trained to do this. I mean, you can of course train a model specifically to do a very specific task and it'll do, and, and we've already know in ML that we can do well with that, but this is really some, some system that can do any such task. So it's really, really, really good at answering trivia questions. Uh, that's on the right. Um, you see the smooth improvement of loss. And then finally on the left, we have arithmetic. So uh, these models are not being trained to do arithmetic. They're basically just reading. Um, but they do really, really well uh, at arithmetic um, anyway, although the trend is much more interesting. Small models basically just don't end up learning arithmetic at all. They're just bad at it. But suddenly, when you make the model bigger, something, there's some kind of phase transition that happens, and you go from basically not being able to even do two-digit arithmetic to getting 100% right. Um, and this is, again, something we don't really understand that well, but somehow there's some kind of like sudden change where the model just realizes from reading lots and lots of text, which, some, which has some arithmetic in it, but, but not that much, what's going on? It realizes that arithmetic is a thing and it suddenly starts to like get it and get it right um, as you build, them, build larger models. Um, so this link that I have at the bottom, um, maybe I'll show you at the very end, um, it's, uh, 
uh, a recent example of these models writing uh, Python code. So you can just tell this model, please write a Python code that will like check if uh, a number is a palindrome or a word is a palindrome. And it'll write a function that checks if it's a palindrome. And it'll do more complicated things than that um, in Python. Um, so uh, we don't understand this very well, but, but uh, <clears throat> these scaling laws are not just a feature of language. That's just what, what we studied first. Um, they also apply to images, videos, uh, other kinds of data distributions. Um, uh, what this means is that simply building larger models with more data just smoothly improves their performance at, at a large variety of tasks. Um, and uh, uh, a crazy thing to me as a particle physicist is that the largest models that have ever been built really only cost on, on the order of $10 million. I mean, maybe tens of millions of dollars, but that's it. I mean, my office, when I get to go to it, is across the street from the Hubble Space Telescope Center. The Hubble Space Telescope costs billions of dollars. That Space Telescope Center is going to be used for JWST, which is a tel space telescope that costs $10 billion. Somehow in computer science, people are crazy. Um, they have not, I mean, no one, no one in computer science is saying, oh, wow, we should build a national lab and train models that cost a billion dollars. No one's really saying that. Um, but uh, uh, they sh they, it seems like that would be a natural thing to do. Um, but this viewpoint is sort of unpopular in computer science, I think. Um, this viewpoint that larger models with more data really just smoothly do better, and therefore it's a natural thing to try. Um, uh, yeah, so this is sort of just revisiting this, this question of how much you hard code into, into the model. Do you give it, do you bias the model to think about the world the way that people do, or do you just let it learn what the best way uh, to go is? And I, I mean, I think a lot of these scaling laws are suggesting that you don't need to teach the human how, he, teach the model how humans think. You can just sort of let it learn, and it will kind of suck up this information like a sponge. Um, so, uh, I haven't focused that much on things that are directly connected to physics, but there are a lot of things if that's, if that's the thing you, you'd like is something closest to physics. Um, so uh, I'll give you two examples. One is that you can take the large width limit of neural networks, so the limit where the matrices become really, really big and the vector space dimension becomes very, very, very big. Um, that limit is, uh, uh, for fairly simple reasons, very much like taking the large n limit in QCD. Um, and you can see, uh, so, so there's a lot of nice work on this by mathematicians and physicists. Um, so this, uh, this idea is called the Gaussian process limit of neural networks or the neural tangent kernel. A lot of the people who've been thinking about it are physicists. So there's Yasemin Bari, Jae-Hun Lee, Ethan Dyer, Ider Lukowitz, uh, Guy Guerreri, and many other people are working on this. Um, it's really very, very much like the large end limit um, that you may be familiar with. Um, another example is uh, phase transitions. Phase transitions really occur in all sorts of places in machine learning. Um, they occur most, uh, one of the most common, commonly discussed versions of this is as a function of data set size versus model size. Um, this is called an ML double descent right now, although I think some of the earliest papers talking about it were, uh, I mean, many, many of them were by people with physics backgrounds. Um, there's a very beautiful paper by Advani and Sachs by this, um, uh, but it was reinvented by Belkin and collaborators sort of as, as, as double descent. Um, the, uh, there are also phase transitions in sort of the amount of data that you use and how generalization occurs. There are phase transitions developed by, noticed by physicists in, depending on whether you use a small or a large learning rate. So there's all kinds of physics phenomena literally in this field, um, although I think I think really there's just a lot to discover. Um, and we don't necessarily have to find things we already knew about in physics in this field. I mean, there's just, there's just a lot that's, that's new and exciting. Um, so yeah, I think the conclusion is that ML is this very impactful uh, uh, kind of science with a lot of interplay between the development of theories and experiments, although I think really right now it's being very driven by, by experiments. These experiments are things where you really can measure anything you want, so it's, it's really great. Uh, you can conduct them uh, on your laptop. Um, there's all kinds of scaling laws. There's all kinds of interesting phenomenology. Um, and I think 
a lot of the things that physicists do naturally can be applied to great effect. Um, and I also think, I mean, and a lot, I mean, a large reason why I'm working on this is I think this is really going to change the world a lot and quickly and in the near future. Um, I think it's really just going to sort of keep taking off. Um, I don't really think it's overhyped. I mean, for the reasons that hopefully are clear from the last 20 slides or so, I think there's good reason to believe that this is going to keep improving and that uh, you can build larger models that are just going to do better. Um, and I think that means that there's a, a really high priority that needs to be put on making these systems safe, making sure they benefit people, uh, making sure that they don't just uh, steal people's jobs and make them click on ads. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why I'm working on it is to try to be in a position to push for uh, kind of benevolent uses of these technologies. Um, so that's it. Um, I can play this video for you because it's pretty cool. Um, but, uh, but maybe I should just stop for questions. Yeah, so uh, it's a pleasure to have Jared and giving such a, a nice talk, which is very elaborative. And since we are completely new in this branch, and so this talk will be really helpful for all of us. And uh, you guys can ask questions if you have and interact with him. So can we upload first? Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, I just forgot. Let's uh, clap for Jared for giving such a nice talk. Thanks. Uh, so there are, there are two scaling laws uh, which I've noticed uh, in the course of this talk. Uh, one is the fraction of people who uh, continue to watch the seminar as a function of the length of the seminar. <laughs> and, and the other is uh, the increase in my knowledge of the topic as a function of the length of the seminar. So I, I really have to thank Sayantan to, for giving this opportunity to people to speak for an extended period of time so they don't have to like fudge over no, the because like i i know that these topics are really interesting and uh, uh, like uh, we don't have any other options to learn with, with, without this kind of forum ah one thing i should mention is uh if you go to so i mean if you just google my name um, and go to my hopkins website um on the teaching section i have like 100 pages of uh, like PDF notes um, on machine learning for physics. So I gave a class on machine learning for physics a year ago. Um, so if you're interested to learn more, um, uh, please check those out. Sure. Uh, oh, there is a question. Please ask. Yeah. Um, I just to quick question about the scaling laws. So is that the cross entropy loss that you're using in, in for the scaling laws? Or? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so in this plot from uh, language modeling, it's cross entropy loss. Okay. Uh, I, I, the, oh, one I follow up, I guess, or uh, is, is that guaranteed to be positive, the cross entropy loss? Uh, yeah, the cross entropy loss is guaranteed to be positive. Are you sure? I thought the KL loss is guaranteed to be positive. But uh, the the KL so the cross entropy loss is this so the cross entropy loss is the KL divergence plus mm -hmm. basically the entropy of the data. So uh, okay. since the entropy of the data is positive, the cross entropy loss is positive. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the other way of seeing that the cross entropy loss is positive is just like uh, it's this function. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like an example of the cross entropy loss for sort of uh, uh, MNIST. And right. as long as the probabilities are between zero and one, that function is always oh, okay. Positive. Okay, I, but for a continuous distribution, then that wouldn't be the case, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. So, so yeah, if the yeah, if the distribution was continuous, that would that would yeah. I think all bets are off. But uh, <clears throat> but we're yeah. Here here when we use the cross entropy loss, I guess uh, yeah. I'm always thinking of the discrete case. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so uh, I had a question, Jared. Yes, um, 
Oh, great. So um, you showed that this machine that just keeps reading sort of words suddenly learns how to do math after a certain critical, uh, critical point. Is that correct? That's, you had a plot showing that. that yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you speculate what it is about that, that critical point that suddenly makes it realize this? Because I find that extremely interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I can say a few things about this. So first of all, this is, this is a machine that read 200 billion words or so of, of text. Um, obvious, like, where do you get 200 billion words? You mine it from the internet. So like, like Wikipedia, I think, is only order like 10 billion words. So this is really like some very, very, very diverse distribution of language from the internet. So obviously, it contains a lot of math. Um, a, uh, an example of a thing that I remember seeing a smaller model learn was, uh, that's sort of amusing, is like, uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of places on the internet where someone writes like how much something weighs, both in pounds and in kilograms. And so I remember some smaller model that didn't really learn how to do, say, three-digit addition, but it did learn how to convert between pounds and kilograms because it saw so many examples like that. So, uh, so like it learned how to multiply by 2.2. But it didn't necessarily learn uh, learn learn all of multiplication. So um, I don't really know what is happening um, here. Clearly, the data contains a lot of information that includes uh, addition. And one thing that we know for sure is it doesn't include all of the problems. So, um, <clears throat> for example, like I don't know, three-digit addition and subtraction here is like above eighty percent accuracy, <clears throat> and um, like definitely much less than 80% of the possible three-digit addition and subtraction problems are in the data set. So it's definitely learning how to generalize someone. It's not just memorizing. Um, but uh, uh, we, yeah, we don't really understand this transition. Um, we have seen that for other algorithmic tasks. So like I, I've seen many other examples where you just say train a model to do addition or subtraction. And there's some like critical amount of data or critical model size where it sort of actually kind of like, like it, it suddenly sort of gets the idea, right? Like there's some idea and it kind of gets the idea and then it starts getting it really right. Um, uh, that's not something that we see very often in tasks that are intuitively more continuous, like, uh, like language modeling in general or uh, uh, like image modeling, things like that, where like the distribution feels in, like it's fundamentally much more fuzzy. But for sort of uh, more algorithmic tasks like this, we, we've seen this. Um, we really don't understand it, though. I mean, there's no like theory for why this happens or when it happens. I suspect there is something like a phase transition going on. Um, in some of the other examples, it looks very much like some kind of phase transition. But, but here, it's sort of hidden because mostly the model's learning how to like write English. And it's also learning a little bit about how to write other languages, because there's a little bit of other languages in the data, and then also a little bit of math. Excellent, thank you. And just one, one quick follow-up question on that. Can you tell that this transition has been reached without looking at the actual output? Like if you look at just the weights and the biases, is there some way to see that there was a transition or is it not like that? Um, that's a very interesting question for further exploration. I think we don't know very much. Um, uh, one thing that I can say is that, uh, is it a little bit more complicated, but um, the simplest thing to look at is what's called the embedding matrix. So, <clears throat> Typically, how these models work is they take, they have a vocabulary. So this model has about a 50,000 token vocabulary. It takes inputs that are in a 50,000 dimensional space and multiplies them by what's called an embedding matrix that maps them to, say, a, a thousand dimensional space. And then it acts within that thousand dimensional space until the very end when it then converts back and makes predictions in this 50,000 dimensional space. So these matrices that convert back and forth are kind of interesting by themselves. and Something that I've seen in, in, from many papers and, and examples is that the way that these embeddings will organize the, uh, the numbers is often interesting. They'll like put the numbers close together if they're sort of like, like maybe they'll put like 20, 30, 40, 50 close together and then like, like, like I don't know, like 33, 34, 35 close together but in a different direction. Um, and so you can see some mathematical structures that are relevant for the meaning of the numbers encoded in those vector spaces. But that's all I know. I, I don't know beyond that. Um, uh, but this is something that like a lot of people who work in quote unquote sort of interpretability of these neural networks are, are interested in or working on. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sure.
Any further questions? Please ask. Uh, I, I have one. Please ask. Sure. So um, you described some experiments you did uh, in to try to verify this hypothesis that the that the exponent was four divided by the dimension. If I understood right. Yeah. Um, do I understand right that you literally would in some of those experiments you would just generate a bunch of data which by hand lies on some submanifold, and d is the dimension of that submanifold. Yeah. So so let me. I mean, I can tell you. So so the uh, like teal points in this plot um, <clears throat> that are labeled teacher student. <clears throat> what I did, what we did was we uh, made up, we, we generated a neural network that had an input with, say, a three-dimensional input space. It then mapped that to, like, I don't know, a 20-dimensional space. And there was some sequence of layers with, like, 20 by 20 matrices, <clears throat> and then it eventually produced some output. And we initialized that network randomly. So <clears throat> that means that the inputs are sort of, like, from a three-dimensional space, um, <clears throat> and... Uh, and therefore, the data really only has three dimensions. Um, but like, there's some complicated function that acts on this three-dimensional space that makes some output. Then we trained a student network um, on this data. Um, and I mean, we, we did various different experiments. But maybe we embedded this three-dimensional space that really matters in, say, a 10-dimensional input space that was all random. We initialized the student as a random network. And we gave it the outputs of this network, this, this teacher network that, that sort of is operating on this three-dimensional space and knows it's three-dimensional. And, uh, and then we trained the student to imitate the teacher. And we asked, like, as a function of how big the, the student was, was, like, how many parameters the student was, how well does it mimic the teacher? And that's how we got this exponent. And then, uh, and then we relate this exponent to, uh, to the dimension. Um, the other, the thing that we're actually plotting here, though, this intrinsic dimension is a measurement. So uh, how do you measure the intrinsic dimension of a data manifold? I think there, there's, a, there's a large literature on this. The thing that we did is if you imagine that you have like a three-dimensional manifold in a 50-dimensional space, um, then, and you just have points sampled from this manifold, you can ask for the, basically the statistics of distances among nearest neighbors in this, uh, uh, of these points in a 50 dimensional space. And if the points really lie on a three dimensional submanifold, then the ratios of distances among nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor, et cetera, um, will have some uh, statistical distribution that depends on the dimension. And so by basically fitting that, you can extract an estimate for the, the dimension. So that was how we made these measurements in cases where we weren't just uh, putting this in by hand. And what is that dimension for like this, the very first set you showed us with these digits from zero to nine? Oh yeah, so that's MNIST, so that's the square. So the dimension was like, I don't know, order, order nine or 10. Um, I according see. to this, according to this measurement. So this measurement was made on the student. So, so, how do, so, so for that example, we took a network that was trained to do well at predicting those digits. <clears throat> then we took, um, Basically, the, we took all of the layers of the network, and at each layer of that network, there's some vector space where the initial image distribution has been compressed into like some vector space, which is, I don't know, 50 or 100 dimensional. And, uh, and so then we looked at the, the points in that internal vector space, and we made this measurement of the dimension uh, via this technique. I see. What was the dimension? I, I forgot now the numbers. The, the data can come to you as vectors in some vector space. Uh, for, for MNIST, it's like 784. Um, and for, yeah, for, for all of these examples, these are all, so CIFAR MNIST and SVHN and Fashion MNIST are all small image data sets. So they're all dimension about 1,000. But should, I mean, am I supposed to interpret this really as meaning that even though they, they lie in this 784 dimensional space, they're, they're localized around some 10 dimensional submanifold inside of that space? That that is the idea, yeah. That is the idea. If you yeah, if you if you if you if you process them correctly, they're effectively in some uh, some sub manifold like that. Um, I mean, uh, well, no, because this is so so. This is also relevant to the task, right? So there are many things that you could do with that data. One thing you could do with that data is like try to model the probability distribution of the underlying pixels. That's different from trying to evaluate what which uh, what numeral is being written, right? So like if you write 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 7, 8, 9, 
you, uh, this network is just trying to figure out what the correct label is. Oh, I see. That's, yeah, a, yeah, I see. that's a different task, yeah. So, so what I would really say is the dimension is like 10 from the point of view where all you care about is figuring out what class the data is in. But if your goal was instead to like model the probability distribution of handwritten numerals, you might find that the dimension was higher because there's a lot of variation among those, uh, among those numerals that, uh, that has some different, different meaning. But if all you care about is what class it's in, then why isn't the dimension zero? I mean, then it seems like it's trying to be ultimately a discrete set consisting of the 10 possible uh, numerals. Yeah, so I mean, I'm measuring this dimension from the activations of the network that's trying to do the classification. So the network, I mean, I think that there is some fuzziness here, but the network is, uh, the network maps the data to some, some sub-manifold, and then from there, it extracts some prediction. So like, as I take like a two and make it look more and more like a three, it's moving around in some space. And at some point it crosses a boundary, but the network is really just trying to like output the, the best probabilities it can for whether it's really a two or a three. And so there's some feature space for, for that, which is not just literally the discrete zero through 10. I mean, to be honest, I'm skeptical of this result myself. Like, I think that, like, it sort of looks too good. Like, it's, it's well, anyway. But, oh, no, I didn't uh, mean to be yeah, skeptical. It, it, it's clearly something cool. I was just, I'm just trying to get my head around what yeah, it means. Yeah, yeah. Any other question, please ask. And if you don't have, then the last chance, I'm going to close. Cool. Thanks a lot. So if not, then uh, we clap for him for giving such a nice talk. And uh, I will upload it in YouTube and share the link with you soon. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Have a safe and uh, like, uh, yeah, we have to all of us in the same situation and uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.